Okay, so I think we are live. Okay, welcome back, guys, to uh, another shadowing session. Today we have Dr. Arnell Wright, and uh, she's a general dentist. And yeah, uh, take it away, doctor. Oh, wait, also the quiz is in the description of uh, this stream and it will be open right as we finish. So uh, I think that's all I have to say. And yeah, you can take it away, doctor. Yes, ma'am. So hello, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, before we get started, I just wanna say thank you so much to Karen and your Smile Shadowers team for allowing me to have this opportunity to share with you all. I'm super, super thankful for any opportunity that I get to speak with students or anybody that's in dentistry. Um, it's really, really a pleasure of mine to be doing this with you all. So I will go ahead and move on through the slides. This is just an outline slide. Um, first, I'm gonna go through my about me. I'll give you a little bit of information of who I am, who's teaching and speaking to you all tonight. I will share what I do in my practice. I'll go through some cases. I will give you some miscellaneous um, pre-dental advice uh, and I'll talk about, you'll see this is an area where I really, really enjoy and I really light up on that miscellaneous part. And then we'll do a Q&A and then you guys can go through the quiz. Now, before we begin, um, I wanna share with you guys what my goals are for this session. I want this to be an interactive session with you all. Thank you to Karen and Elizabeth. You guys are gonna be monitoring the chat for me. I'm gonna share my story with you guys. I want to answer any questions that you may have about the dental profession. And I want to be an encouragement to you all um, for this journey that you're on as you prepare to enter into the field. And as I'm talking, if you think of any questions, just go ahead and jot them down and then we'll save them until the end for that Q&A session that I spoke about. And I'm gonna to try to monitor my time really, really well so that we get all of our questions answered. So here's a little bit more about me. I am Dr. Arnell Wright. As Karen mentioned, I'm a general dentist. I'm a wife and a mother of two baby boys. I have a three-year-old and I have a 12-month-old. And I am employed at a DSO, which is known as in dentistry, it's called corporate dentistry or it's a dental service organization. And um, I have an asterisk right by that because we're going to come back to that um, in a couple of slides about DSO dentistry. I am a true Floridian. I love the sunny weather. I love being outdoors. I am a coffee lover. I have my cup of Joe right here with me and I am also an avid reader and that's something else that I want to speak about as we continue um, throughout this presentation. I am a triple gator. You can see my little head right there at the tip of that arrow point. I graduated in the dental class of 2017 from the University of Florida. I also have my bachelor's there and my master's and both my bachelor's and master's were degrees in food science and human nutrition. So I love the whole nutritional aspect um, and how that relates into dentistry. So. I'm an educator at heart, as you guys who follow me on socials, you already know that I love to uplift, to encourage, to affirm, um, and to help you just see that you can be all that you want to be. And some of my future goals with that educator at heart in mind is that I really desire and plan on becoming um, an academic uh, professor at an institution at some point throughout my career. Um, and as you can see this tweet that I posted in June, it says each one teach one. I really believe that with all my heart. That's just one of my things. Um, I love to reach back and to push you all forward. A little bit more about me, what led me into dentistry is my upbringing. I, if you believe it or not, did not have dental care growing up. I come from a family who survival was our number one focus and um, it led me into this career, not having that dental care all throughout my childhood. It costed me some teeth, it costed me lots of dental visits um, and I was able to connect with a dentist who really, really made an amazing impression on me and that's what uh, started my antennas to stand up and give dentistry a try. The journey into dental school or through dentistry has been 
like no other. It's been something that's really fun. It's been challenging, and um, but it's also very, very rewarding. Um, and each stage sets the sets the standard or the bar for the next step. Um, and even though I'm on the other side of dentistry or dental school, I should say, I'm now working and practicing in the field, there's still so much more to go. There's still so much learning that I have to do. And um, that's what that asterisk would have, was about on a couple of slides ago about me being an avid reader. So the journey before, during, and after dental school, it has been just some of the most amazing years that I've experienced in my adult life. And it's something that I hope to hear about um, from you guys once you go through each of those stages. So as a general dentist, I, this is the most simple way that I can put it. I have a wide scope of practice within the scope of dentistry and included in that wide scope is I get to kind of dabble in a little bit of everything. And that's actually what I love about being a general dentist. I get to perform a variety of procedures, which is including but not limited to like fillings, crowns, bridges, implant restorations, dentures, partials, um, a little bit of ortho through like a clear aligner or an Invisalign type of treatment, oral surgery, which is also definitely my forte. Um, and that's just to name a few of the procedures that I'm doing every single day. Now, what's not listed on the slide right here is that I get to do patient education. I get to course correct and change some negative thoughts and beliefs that patients have about coming to the dentist and how important their oral health is as a contributing factor to their overall systemic health. I get to um, write less prescriptions than what patients want me to write. And I know that sounds super crazy. It sounds like an oxymoron, but um, patient education is a large part of the field. It's a large, large part. And, and half of that education, I really believe, and from my experience, is we have to retrain patients um, just to kind of break some bad habits and break some belief systems. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. And you guys think of any questions, feel free to ask about that as well. So here's some case studies. Now my case studies are probably not gonna be what you guys expect because I wanted to give a little bit of spin on um, your shadowing sessions. Um, I'm, I assume that some of the people who have taught you guys and done some shadowing with you, they have presented, oh, this is me placing an implant, but I wanted to just divulge on some of the, the various things that I'll see coming into my practice. Some of them are, are super fun and some of them you may say, whoa, um, this totally textbook. So this first picture, as you can see right here, this is me with my assistant working on a couple of composite restorations on um, this patient right here. So composite restorations, those are the tooth colored fillings. And the reason why I have a little bit of description is because I want you guys, whenever you shadow, um, I always tell all of my mentees, whenever you're shadowing someone, you want it to be valuable shadowing opportunities. You don't want to have like um, a student shadowing and they're standing off in a corner and they're not getting up close and, and, and personal and asking questions. So I give a little blurb so you guys know if you've never even heard of a composite restoration, it's a filling. It's a tooth colored filling. And so that's something that you need to know how to be able to describe to a patient and in your interview whenever you're at that stage for dental school. If you say that you've seen fillings or whatever procedures and you shadowed and you um, participated in these procedures, you need to be able to explain those procedures. So that's why um, I have a little bit of difference in how I presented uh, my case studies. So composite restorations, those are tooth colored fillings. Basically you go in and we remove the decay and then we fill it with a tooth colored composite resin, okay? There's a bunch of steps that go into it. And if anybody needs some clarification on how we do that, I'd love to do to share those. Now, here's another thing. This is me evaluating a denture case before it's delivered to the patient. The reason why I put delivered in the quotation marks is because that's what we call that appointment. It's called a delivery appointment. So it's the day that the case comes in from the lab typically and we call the patient and get them in or maybe they're scheduled from their last visit. Um, and we go in and we insert that 
denture. So another thing you can say, or another thing you may hear some older doctors say is the insertion appointment. So most of us say delivery, some may say insertion, or some may say seat date for crown and bridge. And we'll get to that in another um, slide as well. Um, so on this day, the patient will come in and they will, will basically seat them in the back and we'll pull out the denture. Um, but what I like to do, and I'm, sometimes I have my staff do this, is we make sure that whatever the patient is coming in for is actually what we have received from the lab. We wanna make sure that if it's a delivery, that the case is not still in wax. So basically what that means is there's a bunch of steps that go into fabricating or making a denture or making a crown or making a partial, right? So making and fabricating are two same things, but for common terms, we say making. And then when we're talking in our you know, professional lingo, we say fabrication. So in the fabrication process, there's a bunch of steps that go into making these dentures, making these removable prostheses, right? Um, once you go through your sets of impressions, you go through setting the teeth, taking the bite, making sure that their um, bite, I'll just keep it simple, making sure that their bite is um, correct and it's measured accurately. Um, and th this goes back and forth to the lab. Or some doctors may spend time, they have a lab on site and they'll do these um, they'll do all of these steps in their office, right? So on the delivery day, they come in and they basically get to leave with teeth. So they've been without teeth for quite some time, maybe or maybe not, um, depending on if they're currently wearing dentures or not, or if, they, if this is their first round. You may do some adjustments on the first day, I typically don't love to make adjustments on the first day because it's so brand new and it's foreign to the mouth that the patient has to get used to having something new um, in their mouth. So they basically take this denture home, they wear it um, for 24 hours. And if there's any sore spots, they come back for a 24 hour check and then they will wear it and then do a one week check to see if there's any other sore spots that need to be relieved or adjusted out of the denture. Okay, so this is a denture and this was a cool case that I loved because the patient wanted this little gold strip right there. Um, and it was something that I had to call my lab and talk to them about and say, hey, um, the patient wants this gold strip in, in her denture. And they were like, yeah, no problem. We can totally do it. So we measured how big it was. We measured what she wanted and um, we saw pictures. We sent pictures and did all of that so that they could, they could duplicate that and make it really nice for the patient. Okay. Now, here I have two photos. Um, oh man, I put the black over it, but I just wanted to say here I'm preparing to take what's called a final impression on a fixed restorative case using the soft tissue diode laser. That was a lot in <laughs> one sentence. But so basically I'm gonna talk about two things here, the laser and I'm gonna talk about the fixed restorative case. Okay, so we have fixed restorative and then we have removable restorative. Removable restorative would be something like this denture. Removable means you can take it in and out of the mouth. Fixed means it remains in the mouth. And I'll show you a photo of um, a fixed option um, in just a moment. So in this case, I was it was on the very first appointment. So fixed appointments are usually about one to two, so two, maybe one to two appointments. It depends on the technology that you have in your office. In my office, we do not have the CERAC machine or like an E4D, like some of these really, really upscale offices has. We're moving to that. Um, but right now, as I said, I'm employed by a DSO, so it's just going to be a step-by-step -step basis. But I am really familiar with the CERAC and the E4D. I learned that in my program at the University of Florida. So um, in this picture, I was actually troughing the tissue, just going around and making sure that I'm opening up those gums so that once I take my impressions for the crown to be made or fabricated at the lab, they'll have completely accurate and visible margins to, to make that crown. And then I just wanted to show you what, what laser it is that I'm using. And, and 
I don't only use this for the final impressions. I use it sometimes to debride periodontal pockets. So for patients who have gum disease, I kind of go in after the hygienist has done their cleaning um, and I'll debride those pockets. I use it for lazing off some tissues or lazing off some um, just abnormal um, I guess some abnormalities that present in the mouth if there's something that I can send to to be biopsied. So I do do that as well. Um, and you can do this to do like a gingivectomy. Gingivectomy is basically moving the gums um, from, from being so visible. So there's a lot of good use for lasers. And I really love this thing. It's like literally one of my secret weapons, okay? And this is another picture that I um, I show up front, up close and personal of the soft tissue diode laser. Um, and as I said here, it's something that I use for patients who have periodontal disease for crown and bridge and to remove soft tissues as needed. Okay. Now, this is another removable case. This is a C over P or, so C slash P means complete denture over a lower partial. So we use a lot of abbreviations in dentistry, okay? So C over P is how you say C slash P. It means complete denture over a lower partial. And that's exactly what's pictured here. If you can follow my mouse, we have a complete denture right here. And then we have a partial denture on the bottom. The complete denture, it replaces a complete set of teeth on top. And then the partial replaces a partial set of teeth on the bottom. So whatever teeth the patient is missing in the bottom, the partial is gonna replace that and it can be on top or bottom, okay? And this is just mounted on an articulator. And I really like this case because I wanted to show you guys um, some of the steps that go into the lab fabricating this case. So they have to set the teeth right now. This entire case is in wax, um, which means that the patient will see this case, they will try it in their mouth, and they will say, yes, I like the size, shape, and color of the teeth. Yes, I like the acrylic anatomy and all of those things, right? So all of the pink, that's the acrylic that I speak of on top and bottom. And then we have the teeth that are perfectly set really, really nicely there. And the reason why it's mounted on this articulator is what it's called, is this is basically a representation of the patient's head without them being in the office. So this is how we capture what their bite and how their jaws um, interact with each other when they're not in the office, okay? So we take models, we mount them based off of their bite um, on this articulator and that basically gives us their head <laughs> or their mouth, their jaw when they're not in our office, okay? Uh oh, let's see. Okay, oh, perfect. So, whoops, sorry guys. So this picture, this is an example of a fixed restorative um, bridge. And so let me go back a few slides. So I was talking about fixed restorative case right here. The picture that I'm gonna show you right here, this is an example of that. So this is what's called a three UB or a three unit bridge. Again, those are, those are those abbreviations. And I, I'm giving you some dental terminology because you guys wanna know what you're talking about um, when you're writing this on your applications and things like that. So this is going from tooth number 11 to 13. So 11, oh, sorry, number 11, number 12, and number 13, okay? So this was the delivery day. So we have a few things going on here. We have this, this mounted case, I guess you can say. Um, this is the lab's version of the articulator that they send back to us. It's mounted, okay? The lab made these this bridge in porcelain. We have this floss that's tied around the bridge. Anytime you insert something in and out of the mouth, that's just a protocol that we have where we tie it on a piece of floss because if it goes in the wrong direction, which it may sometimes, you have that handy dandy floss to where you can pull it out, okay? Um, so that's just a protocol that we follow and that my assistants, they just automatically know. They just put it on a piece of floss and then they try it in the mouth, check the bite, you know, before we, before we do any cementations. So on a visit like this, you saw in the previous slide, let's go back here. So this is called the preparation day. So this is the day that we are making our cuts on the patient's actual teeth. And that's the day that we take the impression for this to be fabricated at the lab, right? 
So what happens is on this appointment, this is called the seat date or the delivery day. Again, we're gonna deliver this bridge or this crown to the patient, right? If it was a crown, it would just be like a single one crown and not those three that are um, together, bridged together, I should say. So what happens is they come in, we remove the temporary bridge that they have in and the temporary is just made out of like a composite material, right? So we remove that off, we clean up the teeth, we um, take an x-ray of this final bridge inside of the mouth, and then we do any adjustments. If the patient says the bite is high or it's too tight, um, we always cross our fingers because we don't like to adjust. I don't like to adjust my pretty, pretty bridge or my crowns. Um, um, so I try to tell my lab to be as accurate as possible <laughs> so I don't have to do nearly as many adjustments, but sometimes um, it's, it's inevitable and you can't avoid it. Um, so they come in, you place this in, we do our x-rays, we make the adjustments and then we cement it and then the patient goes on on their merry way. Okay, this is one of my favorites. Um, procedures to perform, which is oral surgery or tooth extractions. Um, these teeth were non-restorable in the patient's mouth, which means they were no longer able to be saved. This could have been for a number of reasons. For caries, caries is decay. That's another term for decay. Um, the patient may have had what's called gum disease, periodontal disease. Um, then let's see, or the patient may have, it's just mainly like decay. They're just non-restorable, broken down, um, they're hurting, or sometimes patients choose to get salvageable teeth extracted. So basically the last step before a tooth has to be extracted is to perform what's called a root canal on that tooth. Um, and sometimes, unfortunately, patients, they can't afford to have that root canal treatment completed. So they'll just say, I'm gonna extract the tooth. Whenever I have to go through those kind of conversations, I always like to follow it up with, let's talk about some replacement options. Let's make sure that we're considering this because now you're losing two teeth that can be saved and you're gonna have to consider how you're gonna eat. You're gonna have to consider drifting, shifting, um, speech impediments that may develop as a result of those teeth no longer being there. So those are some things um, when it comes down to learning just the whole scope of the practice, you're just employing your critical thinking skills and just making sure that you're just covering and touching all of your bases with your patients. Okay, I think I'm doing good on time. Okay, now this is something that I said I didn't list on that first slide where I listed all of the things that I get to do as a dentist. Patient education is a really, really important thing. And it's one of those things that's kind of discounted quite frequently. Like people don't think about the importance of patient education. Um, right here, I had a teenager who was having some really bad oral hygiene practices and they just didn't know how to floss their teeth. It takes a lot of manual dexterity and you really have to tell them what you want them to do and then you have to show them how to do it. And so in this in this instance, I had the patient hold up the handheld mirror, which I do quite frequently. I need a mirror in every operatory because I really want patients to kind of see what it is that I see. And now I'm starting to use what's called an intraoral camera to sometimes show those things as well. So here I'm showing the patient how to floss. I'm showing them where I want them to floss more because there was some bleeding. And we all know, or maybe you guys don't know, healthy gums aren't supposed to bleed and they do not bleed, okay? So it's really, really important to employ those um, patient education practices into your, your day and to really not overlook that. Patients, they may agree and they may say that they understand and they, they are flossing and they know how to floss, until you put them on the spot and say, okay, I want you to show me how you're flossing. Hey, so-and-so, I want you to show me how you're brushing at home. I want you to show me what exactly are you using to brush or to floss at home? So those are some questions that as a doctor, you have to be confident asking those things because basically their oral care is in your hands and it's in your field of expertise. I hope that makes sense to you guys. Okay, this is actually one of my favorites as well. Um, I have a few favorites here. This is a picture of me working with a patient who was wheelchair bound. Um, I see special needs patients, adults and children, and I see patients who sometimes I don't get to put them in an, in an operatory chair or a dental chair, and I have to do the standing. Um, and so it was easier for me with this patient to deliver his denture with him still staying in his chair. 
I'm pretty sure his caregiver would have helped me um, or helped us transport him over to the chair, but it really just didn't make any sense. So I just wanted to show a, a, just a, a little bit of difference on all of the things that can happen in one day. And this is what I love about being a general dentist because the variety with which we get to think on our feet and we get to pivot and shift all throughout the day. Like there's something new in every operatory on the hour, okay? So this was a case where I did uh, a set of dentures on the top for him and a partial on the bottom for him as well. Okay, now this was a scary case <laughs> and I didn't finish um, this entire case. Like I did the surgical extractions uh, in my office, but um, I worked closely with the prosthodontist team on fabricating what's called an obturator appliance for this patient. As you can see, they have this hole, this communication between um, their nasal and their palate. So their oral, it's called an oral, antra, oral antral fistula or an oral nasal um, communication. Depends on where you go or who you talk to to learn, you know, what lingo you use. Um, but this patient presented, and this is something that's textbook. I would never expect for something like this to walk through um, the doors of the practice, but it definitely caught me by surprise. So I like to keep uh, a faculty member from my school on speed dial for every specialty. I made pretty good relationships with them and I had no fear that day. I called him up, he's an oral surgeon. And he's just like, oh yeah, you just need to do this, 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 this. And I was just like, can I just refer it? And he was like, no, you need to do this case. And so um, I started with the case and I did end up referring just the obturation part because once I connected with my lab, it was not something that they sounded too confident in and I wanted to be really confident um, in providing the final treatment for the patient. And so just to kind of give you a synopsis, an, or an obturator is just basically an appliance that closes this. So it helps with speech, it helps with eating, um, it helps with uh, the bite, like the patient will have some teeth, you can have it with teeth put on it, um, but it'll basically kind of close that thing up. And someone who's really advanced and into, um, you know, the prosthodontic work I felt was just more equipped to handle that case. But the surgical extractions, that was no problem. You see these broken down teeth here, if you can follow my mouse. Um, we have some pretty bad decayed teeth and we just extracted all of those. And unfortunately, um, the patient, she could have saved, you know, those three there, but there's not enough teeth to use uh, to make a partial. So it was just worth it to go ahead and extract all of those teeth. Um, so yeah, I really, really enjoyed that case big time. This is another thing that I get to do as a general dentist. I get to volunteer and give some of my time away um, at a free clinic or free dental day. Here in Florida, we have something called a Mission of Mercy. Um, and I think a lot of places have it um, in different states as well. But we, this was not Mission of Mercy. This was uh, the Freedom Clinic that's associated with the University of Florida College of Dentistry. And I drove up to the clinic that day and we literally were in like a high school gym and we were doing extractions, we were doing root canals and all of this were free. The patients had been lined up from like four in the morning until we began and, and we just go until we finish seeing the last patient. So we have a sterilization team, we have a uh, triage team, we have uh, operate, operations like treatment planning and radiographic team excuse me, and then we have uh, just volunteers of dentists and students that are there to help run the show and get patients uh, the treatment that they need um, at no cost. Okay, now this is what I really, 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 really love, love, love to share. Um, and as you can see, I have a question here that says, do you wanna be a dentist that patients love? And before I answer that question, I'm gonna share with you guys that I don't win with everybody, but I do try. I shoot my shot with every single patient. And if you've been following me for any length of time, you've heard me say that um, on any of my live sessions, you've heard me say that um, throughout my stories. It's really, really important for me to try to win over my patients because our job is a field where patients say quite often, if I had like a dollar for every patient who told me like, I hate coming to the dentist or it has nothing to do with you, but I hate the dentist. I would be a very wealthy woman. And so it's really important to me to kind of change that narrative and to just reshape that thinking as best as I can with every single patient that I encounter. And that takes, it, it, it takes skill and it takes daily practice, okay? So 
if you want to be a patient, a dentist that patients love, I think you should follow this model. And, and this is just my go-to um, triangle. This is just my trifecta, I call it. Um, and I usually change out these things that are in the triangle, but there's one thing that always remains the same and that's leadership. Leadership is always gonna be at the base of the triangle. And whether you know it or not, you just because you're a dentist or you're becoming a dentist, you are still a leader. So it's really, really important for you guys to start developing in and doubling down on those leadership skills. Um, communication skills are a part of that leadership umbrella being able to deliver bad news or negative news in a very positive way and in an understanding empathetic way being able to think quick on your feet when it comes down to treatment quick on your feet when it comes down to responding or listening and hearing patients concerns being able to um, just shift all throughout the day um, and and still keep your energy high and also still making sure that you are prepared for each patient encounter. So leadership is always going to be at the base of that of this triangle. And, and, and if this is something that interests you guys, um, I do teach a leadership course online. And it's something that I'm super duper passionate about because in, in dentistry, it's one of those things where we do not learn uh, to be the leaders of the practice for in depth. We learn how to be very fine clinicians. And that brings me to my next point. To be a dentist that patients love, you do need to have strong clinical skill. Now, I don't do everything perfectly. However, one thing I know my weaknesses, weaknesses, excuse me, I know my strengths, and I am always, always, always trying to better my weaknesses and even uh, capitalize, I should say, on my strengths, right? And that's where that asterisk comes in about being uh, an avid reader. I'm an avid reader. I'm always reading uh, about leadership, self-help. I'm always um, reading about dentistry, uh, just, just diagnosing, giving myself more language to use with patients, giving myself more language to use when teaching my staff, because I can't be the only one that's growing. I have to teach my staff what I'm learning to a degree so that they can be a positive representation of me. That's that leadership piece, right? And then that translates into that clinical skill when I go into a room, okay? And then being being abreast of whatever the latest and greatest is that's happening in dentistry, um, in the news, in, uh, in, in the medical news, I should say, any latest developments that are happening, anything that we are gonna be transitioning in, it's, 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 it's important for me to be able to communicate that with anybody who comes through those doors. And then the tip of the iceberg, which is something that kind of easily goes unnoticed, is building that rapport. It's really, really important for me to hear out a concern. And I know like in business, um, time is money. It's very, very true. And maybe once I'm practicing for a little bit longer than, than almost four years, um, I don't know, maybe I just will be super quick, quick, quick. But I do believe that I can build a rapport with my patients rather quickly. And I think from my experience, I've noticed that they appreciate the way that I'm able to listen. So like my assistant, they will bring the patient back. They will get an idea of what brings them in. They'll go through a gambit of questions and then they'll give that report to me. They'll give me a quick rundown. And then what I do from that is I go into the room and I talk to the patient. I say, okay, this is what I understand. Is there anything else that I missed? Or is there anything else that you'd like to tell me because what you'll notice or what you'll find once you start practicing and once you get into dental school, even once you start your clinical or patient care, you'll realize that patients, they don't always tell everything to your assistant. There's some things that they reserve and they want to share with you directly. And, and I take that opportunity. I ask and I leave it open. I give them the floor to tell me. And then if there's something that I can't address right then and there, then I make sure that I address it before their appointment ends for the day. So keep this in mind. Um, Again, if there's something that you guys are interested in, we can I can definitely um, tell you guys where to where to go, where to you know to reach me for things of that nature because I go into a lot of details. Um, and then these top two, the rapport and the clinical skill, those get kind of moved around a lot. But um, I love this little trifecta for me. And if anybody has seen this, I these are my ten dental admissions commandments because let's be honest, you guys want to get into dental school. Um, and I, I also go through this in my leadership course as well. Um, I've talked about it on a few different platforms. I think one was the SNDA 
conference is where I broke them all down, I believe, this summer. And then I had another uh, chat with the University of Florida College of Dentistry, and I breezed through these. But if you guys are interested in me breaking these down, you can find that that in my um, leadership course as well. But I'll just quickly just mention them um, since we have a little bit of time. You guys need to have a mentor throughout the process. You guys need to make sure that when you're applying, you're not just applying and just submitting any type of application. You need to have everything in order, all of your documents in order before submitting your application. You need to make sure that your letters of rec are strong. You need to prepare for your interviews in advance, which means practicing, having someone ask you questions, practicing in a mirror about how you respond to certain questions or how you even describe yourself. You need to know your strengths and capitalize on them. You need to know your weaknesses and improve on them as well. You need to be able to differentiate between the cost of attendance and the cost of tuition. You need to realize and believe uh -oh, that you do belong there. Let me go back. You do belong there. You need to have a strong why. That why piece, that's the first question that you're going to get in any interview. So you need to know why it is that you're choosing dentistry over any other field that there is. And then last but not least, you need to make sure that you commit to the process, commit to the profession completely, because it's going to be in a lifelong learning situation. You're always going to have, have opportunities to grow, and you need to be willing to put yourself in those positions to do so. Okay. Here are some resources that I have to offer you guys. Um, I do have an ebook. If you are following me on social media, you can purchase this ebook through my link that's in my Instagram bio. And my Instagram is going to be on the next page. And I also host a podcast. We're going through a little shift right now um, because, I, again, I'm always growing, always evolving and learning. And I just want to uh, shift the podcast. But there's some really great episodes there. If you haven't visited it, you should just do so on Apple. It's called the Doctors for Future Doctors podcast. I have a blog that's also going through a shift as well. But my blog, I've had been, been blogging since 2016. So I'm going on my fifth year of blogging um, and it's been so rewarding. Uh, I've enjoyed it so much. And I share some pretty good stories. Um, I share some pretty good encouraging words for you guys there. If you ever need one, you can find it there or you can find plenty on my social media accounts. Um, I do have a mentorship group. And right now I have five students in my mentorship group. It's under the Doctors for Future Doctors umbrella. And this group is amazing. I'm walking with my students through their entire applications process. It's a 12 month program. And right now we are in month six. We did a bonus month. We started in June. Um, but we usually start in July. And so we have our last meeting of the year in about two weeks. Um, we've done everything from mock interviews, looking at their resumes. We have looked at their personal statements and I have speakers who handle all of this for me and I just moderate it, but I'm there as a coach and uh, as an accountability partner with all of them to keep them on track so that when it's time for them to submit that assets application, they're practically ready. So they basically start a year in advance, um, like as they're going through the process. Um, and next year, we're going to be focusing heavily on their DATs, making sure that they have a schedule to study and making sure that they're utilizing the best resources that works well for them. So if you're interested in, in, interested in the mentorship or accountability option, that is definitely something that you can um, also find on my Instagram page. And um, this information is going to be found as well inside of this getting getting in and thriving ebook. It's amazing. It's really, really good. And I'm not just saying that. And it's not just like full of crap. It's actually like there's details in the book. Um, and then as I spoke about earlier, my white coat leadership course, um, which is really, really, young, really, really fun. Um, there, I'm just going to be talking about what are some things that we just can't learn once we're in dental school. In dental school, we again, we learn how to be fine clinicians, which is amazing. Um, and if they were able to teach us how to be strong business businessmen and women, we would be in school for forever. And so um, I take this course and I dive deep into things that I do in my practice, for instance, like looking at certain numbers, um, looking at certain metrics, how I do my morning huddle, how I make sure that the, the rooms are stocked how we do our schedule, how we end our day, 
so that it's prepared for the very next day. Um, how far in advance do we schedule out how we do our lab cases? So I go into basically how to run a practice. And it's crazy, like I know I've only been practicing for four years, but I've had some mentors and I still have these mentors. They've walked with me so closely and they're like, you you just, you're a natural at it. It's crazy. Um, but it's something that I really, really love. And I love to teach it to other people because I realize that it's just, everybody doesn't have that gift. And it's something that we don't learn um, in much detail once we're in dental school. So take advantage of all of those opportunities, look them up um, and let me know which one you're interested in. I'll be so glad to serve you guys in, in such a great way. And then you guys are gonna do your YouTube questions in the live chat. Um, Karen is gonna go through those or Elizabeth is gonna be gathering those questions for me in just a moment. And then, um, these are my handles um, on Instagram. I am at The Daily Dentist. On Facebook, I'm The Daily Dentist ARW. And on Twitter, I'm at My Daily Dentist. And, but if you want to spend the most time with me, you can find me on Instagram at The Daily Dentist. And I also take emails at The Daily Dentist uh, at gmail.com. Uh oh, sorry, guys. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Wright, for sharing that valuable information with us. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, we, <laughs> How was it? <laughs> it was great. Different, right? Great information. And we do have some in the YouTube live chat. I'll go ahead okay. and read them off. First one we have is, how do you balance family life and work as a general dentist? Oh, I love this question. Okay. So as I told you guys, I am a mother of two and I'm also a wife. One thing I do is I plan, 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 plan. I make sure it's crazy. Like I look at our week to see what it is that we have on our calendar, if there are any appointments. Um, and the beautiful thing about dentistry is you can kind of set your schedule. Um, <laughs> so if I need to leave work early, I come in a little bit early or I'll work through lunch or I'll have my staff, hey, just block my schedule in the afternoon. This is what I have to do. And my, my, my team is really on board because they know that I'm, I don't just come to work just to, you know, twiddle my thumbs. You know, they know that I come to work when I'm there. I'm actually there and I'm working. Um, so what I do is I look at our calendar. Everything goes in our phones. Every little thing from, OK, hey, this is the day that we need to do this. We need to do that. We need to do this. I have reminders for every little thing. And I make sure that. I put in, okay, so Google, um, I'm sorry, not Google, but our iPhones, they'll tell you like, okay, you need to leave in order to be on time for this event or for that thing. So I use that, like it is just definitely my guide. I plan our meals. Um, we sometimes we do use HelloFresh because I don't have the time to go and chop up all of these veggies or whatever, you know, HelloFresh comes, it's a box. Or sometimes I don't have time to go to the grocery store. So on those weeks, if we have a very jam packed week, I'll just unpause my HelloFresh and I say, okay, I need this to be sent to me by this day. And then we'll use that for the following week. But planning, planning ahead, um, it's it just does you so much good in, in so many ways. <laughs> That was a long-winded answer, but I hope I answered it really well. Yes, you did. Thank you so much. Uh, the next mm -hmm. question we have is, do you use articulating paper to check the patient's bite? Absolutely. Yes. So for patients who are um, doing the removable, I use, it's called a horseshoe articulating paper. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of that, but it's in the shape of a horseshoe or like a U-shape, kind of like that. So I'll use that. I'll have them bite down and I'll have them slide from side to side. And I have them slide their lower jaw forward. So their bite like that. And they'll go ahead and slide it hard. And then forward. I don't know that helps. Um, and then if it's like fillings, crown and bridge, I'll just use the single strip of articulating paper that's in the shape of a rectangle. Thank you. The next question, I believe this is referring to the second case you had on the slide. And they asked, why would a patient want a gold strip on their teeth? A lot of patients have different reasons for everything. Um, culture, um, this particular case, believe it or not, it was a sign of affluence and wealth. And the patient, when they had natural teeth, they had like a gold tooth. And in their culture, that was a sign that they had money. 
And now that those teeth were gone, this is a part of cultural competency as well. So in school, they teach you, um, you just need to be kind of respectful of everybody's culture. In my mind, we were like, what? And I had no idea. My staff understood it. They were like, yeah, some patients of certain cultures, it is a sign of affluence to have gold in your teeth. And so it, it, it was a symbol of affluence. And so she was, the, and that's not the first time that I've seen that. Um, I've had patients who they're like, oh no, I need this gold there or a certain place, you know, just because of that sign of affluence and it's a cultural part of their, their, their culture. It's very interesting. Yeah. Um, the next question is, how do you determine if a patient needs a fixed or removable denture? Okay. So this is, this, this is, um, it's kind of hard to explain. I don't want it to get too geeky because you guys aren't quite in dentistry yet. So let's see, how would I explain it to a patient? So when a patient's missing a tooth, so I always go through their options from best to worst or most favorable to least favorable, okay? And an option that I also always give, which is to do nothing. You can leave it how it is if that's okay for you if that suits you it serves me well as well you know that's also an option so basically if a patient is missing a single tooth it's best for them to just replace that single tooth with an implant because it's a, only a one tooth problem then but the bridge is still an option an implant it's a fixed option and an implant is more expensive in order to fabricate it, it takes way longer. And I, I give patients all of this discussion. I'm like, it depends on where you wanna spend your money, your time and your energy. This is the best option, but do you wanna wait 12 to 18 months for it to be finished? Sometimes patients say no, and then they go to the bridge. And then the bridge is like two visits. So maybe like a two to three week time frame. So the bridge, um, I, I don't love doing bridges, especially if the neighboring teeth to the one that's missing, if those are virgin teeth, meaning they've never had any caries or decay and they've never had anything on them and they don't currently have any fillings. I don't love that option, but it is still an option. And I try to give patients as many options as possible. And I would prefer for them to replace the tooth by any means necessary as opposed to leaving it because then we have our shifting and our drifting that happens with the neighboring teeth and the adjacent, uh, the, um, the opposing teeth, okay? And so then removable is the next option. It depends, do they want something fixed or do they want something removable? You can get something removable to replace that one too. If you're young, you might not want that because it makes you feel like you're like 60. But if there's somebody that's 60, I say, hey, a removable might be a better option for you. Do you mind taking it in and out? So I don't know if that, that helps. I go through all of them. I, I always start with doing nothing is an option. But if you didn't want to do anything, I don't think you would have come in. And they're like, ha, 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 you're right. You know, so that kind of gets that option out of there, right? And then I say, now, let's determine if you want something that stays in the mouth or something that you can take in and out. And they're like, ugh. I don't want to take anything out. It makes me think of my old aunt who has a denture that flops around. And I say, okay, that option's off the table. I don't even have to go through that option. Make sense? And so then we dwindle it down to let's talk about our fixed options. And then we go through time limit uh, or time frame pricing um, and what it's going to co cost them as far as like coming into the office and number of visits. How, how, was that a good, good uh, comprehensive answer? Yes, I believe so. That actually okay. answered the next question they asked. Um, okay like choosing between the fixed or removable based on price and personal preference. Which exactly. You. Yep. Um, the next question was, how do you make adjustments or work with adjustments with fixed dentures if there are sore spots in the mouth? Fixed dentures. So fix would be like a, a bridge or something like that. So usually the patient doesn't have like a sore spot from like a bridge or a crown. If it's too high, the patient, usually I like to make sure that is done and known before they leave with that thing. And before I even cement it in, because I hate cementing it in the mouth because now you have so much variation and you're trying to figure this whole thing out. Whereas you can, before it's cemented, you can take it in and out and they can, they can feel their bite 
with it in and out of the mouth a bunch of different times. Make sense? So um, when it comes down to a denture, though, if that's if that's what the patient, I'm sorry, not the patient, if that's what the student is asking, um, the patient will wear it. So if, if it's, let's say it's 24 hours after the delivery, the wearing the denture for 24 hours, it marks the mouth in the spots that are sore. And that lets me know where to relieve. And then there's a spray that you can um, paint or a paste that you can put inside of the denture. Like if you remember that one that had the gold, where the denture inserts in the mouth, there's a paste that you can put in there and whatever the sore spot is, it'll mark it there. And that tells me where to relieve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's very cool. I didn't know mm -hmm. that. There's so much. <laughs> oh. Um, let's see, another question we have, I believe was referring to the very last case that uh -huh. had the, uh, where you worked with the Operated. prosthodontist. Mm -hmm. um, they asked, um, was that from like a genetic issue or like a palatal defect? No, it was not. Um, the patient actually was a former drug user and um, they ate a potato chip and the, the sharp edge of a potato chip ripped their palate because they were previous, they were, they had a history of drug abuse. Mm hmm. Yeah, it was a very, very good case. Like I, I felt good helping out with that case. Yeah. Very interesting. Let's see. The next question I see is how old was your youngest patient with full dentures? If you had any. Oh, man. Yes, I do. I have a patient who I think like 28. 28 years old and there are some patients who unfortunately they just say I'm not going to take care of my teeth I want to extract them all you know like not healthy teeth meaning there's some broken down ones there's some that need root canals some that need crowns fillings it takes a lot to restore them back to optimal health and in their mind it's a little too much and so they say all right let's just extract them um, that, that didn't happen with my 28 year old patient. She actually had been wearing dentures before sh she became my patient. And this was her, her new set that we fabricated for her. Yeah. You see some crazy things like things that you do not expect with some young patients. Yeah, for sure. All right. The next question that I see is, this is about the DAT. It's asking, how did you study for the DAT? Oh, oh my gosh, that test. I'm so glad I don't have to see any more of those tests anymore. So I did Kaplan course. This was after um, I ordered, I spent a lot of money on the DAT. Oh my gosh. But you guys have better options, I believe, now, nowadays. Um, I did Orgoman, which is the um, DAT destroyer. And organic chemistry was one of those weak places for me. Again, knowing your weaknesses and your strengths and knowing how to course correct is just going to behoove you so much. So I knew that I wasn't strong in orgo and I ordered that other book. So it cost me about $300 to do that. And then I enrolled in a Kaplan course. And from that Kaplan course, I, I got on a very tight schedule and that helped lay the foundation for me it helped kind of connect some pathways and connect some dots for me. And then from the Kaplan course, I would make note cards um, and I would kind of write practice questions for myself, um, make sure that I knew how to answer them confidently. And then lastly, I took a ton of practice tests. But what I've heard so far from you guys, uh, or from, from a lot of people who are currently going through the process and some of my students even, I prep is a strong, resource as is boot camp those are the two so far that i've consistently heard time and time again um that those two resources i prep and boot camp they are very strong resources for you all and and i'm not i'm not endorsed by any of them um i, I i've just heard from my students and from people on social media uh that i prep and boot camp are are really strong resources Thank you. Um, these next couple of questions are about the mentorship program. So one is asking, is it possible to join? Is it too late? And if there's any cost to joining the mentorship program? Yes. Okay. So it's, it's too late to join this round. Um, what I would ask for anybody, and, and I go through, 
I go through a selections process because, and there is a cost um, to, to just be straightforward. There is a cost for the program, but I do go through a selections process because I wanna make sure that I'm the best person to guide and mentor you. So I only have five students. I had a ton of people who reached out, but I knew that I couldn't manage that many in the first round. And so I wanted to just be really intimate um, because I also do uh, a mid mid month check in with each person individually. So we do a group session per month and we do uh, like one or two calls individually where they just have my undivided attention. I can kind of talk to them, check on them um, and see how they're doing. And so. I really like for you guys to do like an intake form to see what your needs are, to see if I can even help you because I don't wanna, it's not like about, oh, let me just get as many people and do a volume of students um, and, and have this big load of students and I know that I can't manage it and then then to accept your, your money. So, um, but yes, so my enrollment is actually opening up again in January and um, if anybody is interested in it, I have a link in my social, here I have a, I can go to Instagram and there will be a link for you to express your interest there. And for anybody who wants to, I usually do the intake form and then I have a Zoom call, like a, just a 10 minutes, just to put a name with a face to say, hey, what is it that you really need? And and I say, all right, I think you'll be a good fit or I think that I can help with those needs. Um, but it's been pretty, like, it's been really enjoyable for me because I'm seeing how, like, we did mock interviews last month, and I just sat in on in the interview. I didn't participate. I had some interviewers come on, and they asked some questions, and there was there was some growth that I see that needs to take place, but we still have six months of time to, for, to see that growth, you know what I mean? So we gave feedback and it was just such an amazing, um, it was just really rewarding for me to know that I can like give back to students in, in that way. <laughs> I get really excited about that, sorry guys. <laughs> that's great, that's great. It's really helpful to have someone that's already completed an entire process there with you, so. Yes, for sure, for, for sure. But I also don't claim to know everything. So if there's anything that I feel like you guys can benefit from that I don't know because I'm far removed from dentistry, I bring on someone who is in that seat right there, someone that I trust with you all or whoever the students are, not just some random person, but it's just I bring on people who I know can speak to where you are. Does that make sense? That does. All right. Another question I have is, what kind of letter would you consider to be a strong recommendation letter? Oh, someone someone who goes in depth about what you've done. Not only, not only, okay, so and so was in my class and they got an A, or because believe it or not, letters can sometimes <laughs> come very short, very short. So someone who talks about who you are as a person, your character, what you can contribute to the profession, how they see you, um, what what they, they speak volumes about more than just your grades, um, just who you are and just what you bring to the table, you know what I mean? And if you would be a good fit, like, I think that's really, really important for you to make sure, like when picking your recommenders, like it's someone who knows you a little further beyond just the grade, the grade book. Does that make sense? Yes, that does. Thank yeah. you. Another yeah. question, I believe they're referring to the very first case with the mm -hmm. composite restoration. I believe they're asking what material that is. Oh, composite resin. So I will use, um, there's something called Filtech Supreme and it, and it varies um, per tooth. So you can use flowable composite. I really, I really like uh, Filtech Supreme or I like Z250, like a, it's just a composite material. And then of course we shade match um, while the patient's getting numb, my assistant will do the shade matching. Um, and let's see. Oh, another one that I'm experimenting with, it's kind of crazy to say I'm experimenting with, but it's called Orochroma, and it's supposed to be like a universal shade. It's one of those newer composites that just come out, mm, I believe, two years ago, um, and it's supposed to be like a universal shading um, composite. So I've tried that on a few patients before as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
see. I love the fact that so many questions are coming in. Wow. <laughs> there are. Uh, let's see. I think you answered the question about the patient that had the hole in their palate. Let's see mm-hmm. next. Oh, another question is, why did you decide to pursue a master's degree? Oh, okay. So this is good. I was not quite ready for dentistry. Um, I I had to learn how to study. Like, you know, you come out of high school, you're like at the top of your class, but high school was high school. And you may or may not have to put forth that much effort. <laughs> and so that was me. I was that kid and um, I had to learn how to study all over again. And it's not that I had horrible, horrible grades, but my grades weren't competitive enough to get me into dental school. And so after applying and not getting in, I had a, a meeting with faculty at Florida and they basically told me, hey, you need to get a master's. I followed their instructions. I got the master's and I did a research master's. Now, did that put me behind two years? Behind, I say that lightly, but it put me back two years, yes. Um, But I was okay with that because if that meant that I would get in by taking their advice and doing well, not only doing the master's, but doing well in the master's, you have to show growth, you have to show progress. If you're not gonna show growth or progress or if you're not doing well, then your best bet is to stop, regroup, figure out your your plans and and what your goals are and then try again. Does that make sense? Like showing progress is vital. You can't just enroll into a master's just to kind of get you there or to check that box. You don't want to do that. You want to make sure that progress from your undergraduate GPA or undergraduate science GPA and now your upper level master's GPA, like there is a significant difference in who you are as an applicant because that one person, you know, in undergrad, that was one applicant, right? But then now that you've you finished a master's or even a, um, what are those, post backs? I asked about a post back, um, and my recommendation was given to me to do a thesis research master's. And so I, I, I did that, I had gotten into a post back and, and a master's, and I, I gave the option, and she told me, Mm-mm, do the master's. And so I took it. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Hey, Karen's coming back in. Oh, hey, Karen. Hey, hello. Um, so thank you for answering all of those questions in the YouTube Absolutely. chat. Yeah, and I always like to save these questions for the end because I feel like they apply to all um, dentists. But uh-huh. I think first question is, how has the pandemic, how has COVID-19 affected your practice your patients and just um, your lifestyle as a dentist in general? Well, from a PPE perspective, we, PPE was very low coming back to work. So no secret there. It was very, very low. So we had to pivot and we had to decrease significantly the amount of patients that we would normally see. And honestly, I wasn't really mad at that because I, I just felt like it allowed us to just kind of regroup and to get some systems down and to fine tune, um, just kind of tighten the screws a little bit in the whole organization, if that makes sense. Um, I am very, I'm a dentist who's very hands-on. I'm not only the dentist who does the clinical dentistry. So I like to know where we are from an inventory perspective. I like to know what our numbers are um, with with our patient count, with how many pa- new patients are coming in the doors, what we need to decrease on if we need to ramp up. So I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit more involved in like the operations of the practice. So um, PPE was a struggle. Um, explaining to patients that they have to like wear their mask coming in. That was a thing as well. And then and then responding to, you know, patients being surprised that we wear masks, even though we've always worn masks in dentistry, you know, um, everyone's so aware of it now, but mainly the difference was just a decrease in the amount of patients that we've seen. Um, uh, so instead of seeing, let's say, I don't know, 10, 15 new patients, we went down to three. You know, like we, we, yeah, we, we were not seeing very many and, and quadrant dentistry is a term that you guys may or may not hear of, but we like to do quadrant dentistry anyway, but it became pretty much mandatory. Like I told the staff, we need to tell the patients, Hey, we only want you to get numb one time. We only want you to come in one time. Let's, let's, if you have three fillings on the top, right, we're going to do all three of them. You know what I mean? Like, so really just taking the bull by the horns and saying, all right, this is what we're doing. This is why we got to do it. The aerosols is too much. You know what I mean? So 
that those are some of the changes that 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 took place for us. Okay, that's really interesting to hear because um, the office that I work, at, I think they're doing um, similar things, and like I think I'm just really curious as how offices are responding to the mm-hmm. pandemic, especially in areas that are seen as more uh, people like more people are getting cases right now. I know, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we do the whole nine with PPE, and there are some offices who do not. We we wear our shields, we do our masks, um, we have, and I I even I don't think I have it with me, but I have my mask on like a, a lanyard over my head, so I'm always having a mask around my neck, even if I as I change my masks um, between patients, um, I always have like a mask on, like I just pull it up like that. We do our safety goggles, our our heads are always wrapped up in something. Um, our shoe covers, our gowns, um, and it gets pretty hot under there, but I mean, it, it, it's just a part of the job and, and we've in dentistry, it's kind of been like this, you know what I mean? But it's just more elevated, you know what I mean? Like we kind of have to do it and we, we don't want to be like the odd man out, like not, not participating, you know? Um, it's just all about our protection, you know? Yeah, completely understand. Um, so I think, I like to always save this question for last, just to sum everything up, but uh, what advice would you kind of give to your previous self as whether it be pre-dental or um, for example, when you just graduated like fresh out of dental school? Fresh out of dental school, I would tell myself, um, so lifelong learning is a thing and to continue like having that hunger like I haven't lost it yet it's crazy so (laughs) you I think you see like it dwindles down around like year five or maybe like seven but I would just tell myself to to continue going hard to um continue being super hungry for the wisdom and the knowledge about the field so my idea is I want to be the best and it's not only the best clinician I want to be the best leader. I want to be the best um, advocate for the patients. I want to be relatable to my team, approachable. So I just, I, in every area, I try to find, okay, what can I sharpen? Um, There's a book called Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It is one of my favorite books of all time. It has just transformed the way that I do my life or I approach life. And of course, under that life umbrella includes my profession. And so one of the habits is sharpening the saw. And I told you guys, I'm an avid reader and sharpening the saw means like always evolving, always sharpening yourself in one way or the other. Today, it may be from a professional perspective. Next month, it may be from a personal perspective. And I personally believe that even if you're sharpening your saw personally, it can only improve how you are as a leader, as a businesswoman or man, as a doctor, as a whatever it is that you do. Um, so I would tell myself to continue sharpening the saw, always be hungry about doing it. And that's something that I teach my students. So in my mentorship program, um, we start off, the first thing we do is we do a personal growth thing to give themselves language on, they don't know how to talk about themselves. Like who, who knows how to talk about themselves like confidently without sounding super arrogant, you know what I mean? And sometimes you're like, oh, I don't really know anything about myself. And it's like, well, you need to know something about yourself because you're gonna have to write a personal statement and you're gonna have to talk about yourself a lot in an interview. So, you know what I mean? Like I asked them some very deep questions that you're like, wow, I would have never thought of that. And I'm like, good, because now you're going to use that to build on to your personal statement. You know what I mean? Like we literally go from ground zero. And, and, and I just love that whole sharpening the saw piece. So that's um, that's what I would tell myself. Sorry, I, get, I love this stuff. So. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Dr. Wright, for answering yeah. all the questions. Mm-hmm. And for this session, I think we're going to wrap it up here um if you could just go back to the slide with your contact information just so everyone can see for the last time yes absolutely guys um please reach out to me i'm not a stranger don't be a stranger um if i take forever to reply it's because i really like to give my best responses and make sure that um i'm answering all of your questions so it's not that i'm ignoring you i love to reply to everybody and i want to give everybody some 
um, just some attention and some love through social. So reach out, um, click those links in my bio. If you want to sign up for the leadership course, the mentorship program, I would love, 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 love to um, take it further and, and have that discussion with you guys. Karen, please don't be a stranger. Elizabeth, don't be a stranger. You guys are doing amazing work um, for these students. How many people were on the chat, by the way, or on the in, in the course? Uh, so right now there's 94 people watching, but there were 216 playbacks oh on this session. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. You guys are doing great work. Keep up the, the great work. And I mean, if there's anything that I can do, or if you want to invite me back on, <laughs> I would love to come and chat with you guys again. Um, hopefully I wasn't too informal, you know, I'm in a coffee shop, you know, so sorry guys. <laughs> no, I think you're, I think you're completely fine. We, we are planning to have um, panels in the future with certain topics and certain kinds of specialties and everything. So yeah, if you're open to uh, us inviting you back for one of those, maybe. Um, yeah. So uh, for, for everyone watching this session, I'm going to open the quiz right now. Um, just refresh the page and yeah, uh, quizzes will be graded up till I think two-ish hours after the session. Nice. So if you have any questions, um, just uh, DM, us, DM us on Instagram. But uh, yeah, uh, the session is done. Thank you again, Dr. Wright. Good job, guys. Yeah. Good job. You guys are amazing. Thanks, Thanks. guys. <laughs> okay. Yeah.